I want you to turn here this evening to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 23. 1 Samuel 16, 23. I want to speak just a little bit on the presence of God. The presence of God. We speak about the presence of God. We, we, we speak certain attributes and what it is when we say the presence of God was there or this or that. Well, let's learn a little bit more about the presence of God. I will tell you that the presence of God is very important in the house of God. When you don't have the presence of God in the house, it is indicative that God is not very near. And you'll learn, and we'll learn this together as we proceed. In 1 Samuel chapter 16 and 23, I'm going to show you how powerful the mere presence of God is and its effect on the spiritual forces of darkness. And let's look at it. It's the last verse in the chapter. First Samuel 16 is a familiar story. I'm not, re I'm not reading it all. I'll bring you up to point on it in a moment. In verse 23, I'll tell you what, let me begin with verse 14 and then go to 23. Verse 14, same chapter. It says, but the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. That is probably the saddest words of your Bible. You never want that spoken as an epitaph over your life or my life or anybody's life. Because when the spirit of the Lord departs from somebody... It leaves them open to nothing but the evil forces of darkness to have a heyday to destroy the light. And as a result, there is absolutely no protection from God on that light. They literally become fodder in the hands of Satan, and that's exactly what happened to Saul. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him, agitated him, irritated him, worked him into total frenzy and misery. That's all contained here in the Hebraic terms of troubled him. First of all, let me clarify that the Lord does not own, in the sense, evil spirits and, and send. He doesn't have a personal evil spirit he sends upon you. It's ascribed to him in that particular era because he would permit that to happen. Because when his spirit left, the Holy Spirit left and departed Saul, then an evil spirit ev immediately invaded the life and took advantage of the vacancy of the Holy Spirit being in the life of Saul. And so keep it clarified, God is not in the business of sending evil spirits to irritate people. It simply means that he permitted that to happen because of the vacancy of himself voluntarily leaving because of the sowing and reaping and the dishonor of Saul to the very Spirit of God. And so notice what's going on. Then in verse 23, we come to the heels of this story that on, on uh, what is happening is he is agitated continuously uh, by these evil spirits. In other words, he's losing sleep. There are times he is so restless. There's times he, you can almost say, breaks out in hives. He's worried, he's agitated, he's irritated. And sleepless nights, agitated days, attitude has disintegrated into nothing more than he's just a brash sort of tyrant in his attitude. And there are times he cries out for relief. Imagine this, a man to the heights of God that Saul was at one time and now in the deplorable depths of misery and hopelessness and a condition nobody should ever want to be in. And now he is crying out, I find somebody to bring me relief. I can't take it. I feel like I'm going to implode or explode, whichever. And verse 23, now let us read together. Ready? And it came to pass... When the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took an harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. Now notice that the, the behavior of Saul changed due to whose presence was manifested. When evil spirits was in the room or nearby in the vicinity, the presence of evil would envelop or overshadow or lay upon his life. As a result, his behavior became related to the spirit that was near him. But when David began to play, 
play the harp. Notice he played the harp. You cannot, I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to. Uh, <laughs> He played the harp. He did not play rap music to drive demonic power out. I'm just, I, 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 all right. He didn't play uh, grunge music, heavy metal music, or anything like that to drive it out. As a matter of fact, if he'd have done that, the evil spirit would have felt at home and say, my goodness, uh, doesn't feel any different than where we come from. Can you say amen? And so when he played the harp, not only just playing it skillfully, uh, but he played it with a heart's affection to God. He was playing the harp as worship unto the Lord. As a result of David's focus, concentration upon God, then the Spirit of God came into the vicinity and the presence of God now invaded the room where Saul was. As a result, light always overcomes darkness and therefore when the presence of God enters a place, darkness always leaves. When God's presence comes into a house and fills it, it means there is no room for Satan to operate. He is dispelled. He is, dis he is literally dispossessed and taken out of the area. Can somebody say amen? And so when he's playing this music, the presence of God is now manifested. Now, I want to stop there for a moment. God is not a presence he is a person with a presence. Now, I'm going to go somewhere with this. I want you to follow me. You see, God is not a presence. We don't worship presence. We worship a person who is God, who is a person. But nonetheless, this person, God, has a presence, uh, uh, an aura, an atmosphere that is around him. And how you know you're getting near him is because you are now entering his presence. The closer you get to God, the more powerful his presence becomes. <laughs> This is what, like Donnie was just sharing a little while ago, this is why in churches today, and let's use the difference here, if a church is dead, let's admit, if a church is dead, let's admit we're dead. <laughs> That's the first thing. If the church is dead, what do they mean by dead? They mean that the atmosphere is not charged. It is as if, as if God's presence is no longer in the building. The reason why is presence indicates the nearness of a person. If I say, we're using Donnie again, if Donnie walked into this sanctuary, I wouldn't have to be standing right next to him, but I could be standing over here and he's in the back of the room, but I'm still in his presence, meaning that if I'm in his presence, that means that he's very near, he's within the vicinity, amen? If he leaves the building and goes home, I would no longer say I'm in the presence of Donnie. I would say I'm in the presence of Donnie because he is near in that vicinity. So when the presence of God is in a place, in a church, and you can feel it, and I'm going to get to that in a little while, then that indicates God is within the vicinity vicinity of that congregation. <laughs> now, now we don't get, we don't seek or get drunk, so to speak, on the presence. We get the person and the presence will be manifested. All right. Now, now his presence, his presence is evidence of his person. In other words, just like the quack is not the duck, but the quack indicates the duck is nearby. All right, can we drive it down? The bark is not the dog. You do not say the bark is the dog, but the bark lets you know he is nearby. Uh, it's like the whistle is not the train, but the whistle is letting you know there's a train coming down the track. Amen. It is just like the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a person. He is not fire, but he purifies like fire. 
He's not water, but he will cleanse like water. He is not wind, but honey, when he moves, there is like wind that comes in, amen? On the day of Pentecost, he came, and before he ever come, wind filled the house where they were sitting, and the Holy Ghost came on the heels of the wind. <laughs> well, I'm about ready to preach myself happy here tonight. You realize, I, I want the presence of God, but to have the presence of God, you got to get near the person of God. <laughs> see, see, we have to always be careful in modern Christianity that we, see, obedience attracts the person of God. If I can live in disobedience and try to mimic the presence of God, which will result in a shallow experience, it'd be better let's obey God and really get his presence in the house. In other words, that's why here at this church, we're not interested in light shows and smoke machines and all kinds of erratic things to try to substitute to work people's emotions. Don't need that. Why? Because if we get the person of Christ near us and we get near him, we'll get his presence and that will not be a shallow experience the closer the high priest got in the tabernacle to the holiest of holies, the more magnified the presence of God came. And honey, the closer you get to God, honey, I want to tell you, there comes a more holy aurora about where you are. Glory to God. You see, Old Testament men would suddenly sense or feel an anointing like Samson. And I'm going to come bring this on down here in just a moment. But, but the Holy Spirit... The Old Testament, they'd sense or feel an anointing. Come on, Samson could feel that anointing. Now, there is a tangibility to this. You see, Saul was changed when the Holy Spirit came upon him early and he became, excuse me, a different man. Aren't you glad that in the presence of God, it will change people into different people than what they were? Yeah. Amen. Well, we need that today. <laughs> I, I, I am convinced that counseling, even though there's good things in counsel and advice and doing those things, but at the end of the day, obedience is better than anything else. <laughs> there seems to be, in your Bible, there seems to be two distinct pictures of the presence of God. Uh, uh, the universe, pr the universal presence of God, which we entitle it theologically as omnipresence. We call it the omnipresence of God, meaning that there is nowhere in the universe where his presence is not indicated or something of that nature. In Psalm 139, 7 and 8, it says, whether, uh, David said, whether shall I go from thy spirit or whether shall I fee flee from thy presence? Verse 8, if I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. He is referring to the omnipresence of God. Doesn't matter where you are in the universe, his presence. Now, but if we break it on down, there is a number two to this, another side of the coin, Brother Ron, if we can say it like that, that there is the manifested presence of God refers to when you sense him or you feel him. Now, I'm not talking simple goosebump. I'm talking spiritual feeling, sensitivity in the spirit that God is near. I feel his presence. Now, there, there's the second side of it. I'll even tell you that in Luke 5, 17, that even the presence of the Lord was there to heal. The power of the Lord was present to heal. People was getting healed or was to be healed even in the presence of God. This is why at times I will stop a, a, a worship like on a Sunday morning or whatever, and if there's a certain flow, then all of a sudden I realize, all right, if you need healing in your body, come to the altar. I know that faith, has now arisen in people's hearts and I know the presence of God has really magnified and concentrated. It's time to step into the water and receive what God has for you. Amen? Now, the very presence. Now, there's a difference between the anointing of God, the glory of God, and the presence of God. We're not dealing with the anointing that breaks yokes. We're not dealing with the glory of the Shekinah glory that's all apart, the heavy uh, issues that of God. We've dealt with that before. There's dealing with the presence. When you go to a restaurant, let's, let's use the difference here on Sunday. When you, when you go to a restaurant, it's different sitting in the restaurant than it is sitting in the house of God on Sunday morning worship. 
You say, what do you mean? Well, I'll tell you why. <laughs> because when you're in Sunday morning worship, people are singing and worshiping and focused on God. When you are focused on God, the presence of God is there in the house. When you walk into a local restaurant after a Sunday morning meeting, it doesn't feel the same way in the restaurant as it did in here. That's not an accident because in that place, nobody is worshiping God. Nobody is concentrating on their own. chicken and mashed potatoes. That's their focus. Nobody, I, you say, well, I see church crowds in there eating. Yeah, most of them left a place that didn't concentrate on God, so why wouldn't they at the restaurant? All right, now, so, so when you walk into the restaurant, it doesn't feel the same as it does in the house of God. Why? Because here in the house, and I'm building this to, for a reason, to the, for, there is a necessity to get into the house of God. And one reason is we need to be in his presence. Oh, I don't believe that's in a building. Oh, I got Bible for this. The necessity of the house of God. You see, it is the manifested presence when you sense God. You know why? Because his spirit will bear witness with your spirit. If there's an increase, magnification of God in his presence, you will feel that in the room. You can do it in your own prayer closet. Is that right? In your own prayer closet, you have been worshiping, praising, worshiping. I mean, just however, just, just flowing in just praise to God. And the next thing you know, you feel his presence in that place. You see, you feel a reaction. What do I mean by that? Let me describe it just a little bit more. When I say you feel or sense God, you will feel a reaction, not so much in a goosebump, but you'll feel a reaction in your heart that may either cause you to weep to cry or even to laugh in the presence of God. People react different ways in the presence of God. You see, look at me in Psalm 73. Let, let's look at Psalm 73. This is, uh, uh, this is amazing. Psalm 73 and verse 3. See why church or the place of consistent abiding presence of God is. Why we need the house of of worship. In Psalm 73, 3, it's going to answer a question later in the chapter, but let's begin with verse 3. Let's all read this together because we have to be careful of the focus of our lives because what we focus on will determine a lot of things in our heart. What we focus on will also determine what we feel about something. Now, let's look at verse 3. Ready? Let's read it. For I was envious at the foolish. What, what, what happened? When I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Stop. Look at that now. Why is David envious or jealous or becoming resentful at the foolish? Because he is looking, saw, when I saw, he's staring at the wicked prospering. As a result of that, he becomes disenfranchised, he becomes disenchanted, he becomes upset, he becomes discouraged and disheartened because the wicked are prospering. As a matter of fact, they're the wrong people to focus your attention on. Can you say amen? In verses 16 and 17, you know, you look at verse 16, the same chapter, he says, when I thought to know this, he said it was too painful for me. When I thought to know this, when I, when I, when I, when I was becoming perplexed at, at why all of this was happening, it was too painful for me. But notice what brought correction to his life. You ready? Read 17. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. In other words, at the end of this, I understood that their end is not worth chasing what they're chasing after. Can you, can you say amen in here? Until I went into the sanctuary of God. Do you know that my focus, my, my, what I'm concentrating on is corrected in the presence of God? When you, all right, you say break that down. Here we go. When people come into the church where the presence of God should be, then people come into the church broke down 
and there's times they are broke down emotionally, broke down because of uh, mentally. They are broke down because people have beat them all week. They're broke down because of bad news all week. They're broke down because of events in their life that, that is just spiraling things out of control in their families. People come in to the church broke down and they are focusing now on the wrong thing because all week everything is vying for their attention, vying for them to look at this stuff that's happening with their family, their, their wife, their, their spouse, husband, their, their, their children, their work, their job, their co work all of this stuff is vying. And next thing you know, they start looking at the things instead of at Jesus. And then uh, when they come in, they're focusing on the wrong thing. But when they come in, like tonight we sing uh, uh, how great our God is and what a mighty God we serve. Do you know what happens? Because they have come into the presence of the Lord in the sanctuary, God now is recorrecting their focus and they're not looking at the problems. Now they're singing what a mighty God we serve. And the next thing you know, they start getting encouraged and they start getting lifted. Lifted up. Why? Because in the presence of the Lord, there is joy. <laughs> you see, when their focus is redirected and when they leave the church, they hear a sermon, they hear a teaching, the preaching, they hear something that lifts them up and when they leave, they leave feeling different than when they came in the house. We sing a song, you won't leave here <laughs> like the way you came. Can somebody say amen? You see, now listen, don't stay out. People should realize, don't stay out of church when things are going bad. That's when you need the house of God the most. <laughs> Whew, glory to God. Don't let the devil walk you out of church when things are going bad. That's when you run into the presence of God with like-minded people. Let God redirect your focus in the sanctuary and when you leave, everything's going to be all right. You know, it's so important to be in the presence of God. God's presence will even bring conviction and correction. Let me take you a little further. When God's word is spoken, I don't care if it's here. Bonnie was talking about it a little bit ago. And speaking to people with the word of God, when, when any time the word of God is spoken, do you know that God's presence emerges at that moment? Amen. His presence is attached to the spoken word of the living God. When you speak, you say, well, I don't know about that. All right, try this. You that watch the television, try this. On Monday morning, when you go into that job, you, you want to see the effect of the Word of God in the break room. Take the conversation to the Word of God and watch the atmosphere completely change right there in the break room. You'll start seeing people get holy right before your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> That's the power of the presence of God. Now in Jonah, now you can turn there if you'd like, in Jonah chapter 3, just turn at the end. But in Jonah chapter 3, in verse 4, look at the power. In verse 4 it says, And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried. I mean loudly he shouted it out, and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now, first off, was God's omnipresence there before Jonah arrived? Yes, that's right. His, the omnipresence of God was already there. However, however, the manifested presence of God in concentration was not. They were there living wickedly. Ninevites, those, I mean, those people were something else in this old Assyrian empire. They were brutal people. Went around, no, didn't have hardly any conviction at all. They lived life deplorable, Brother Ron, just terrible stuff and unmentionable things that they did in everyday life. As, 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 as you see that, well, the omnipresence of God is everywhere, but the, the manifested presence is not being seen. But when Jonah begins to preach, something begins to change in a wicked city. Because God will use you and me as a vessel or an instrument to bring his presence into a place. Are you still here tonight? Even tomorrow, now this, this taping here for those viewing, you know, just before Thanksgiving, uh, you know, you, you may be sitting with in-laws tomorrow who are heathen folk. 
But God is going to use you to manifest his presence in that place. Now, now, now notice here, uh, these are wicked people. Now in verse 5, look at verse 5. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. Verse 10, and God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. God repented of the evil that he said that he would do unto them and he did it and did it not. See, what, <laughs> what happened here, the presence of God got ushered in on the heels of the word being preached. And the presence of God began to fill the city. Conviction happened as a result. Why isn't there more conviction today in houses of worship dotting the land of this good old USA? Because when the word exits the pulpit, so does the presence of God. Amen? And so we need to concentrate. What I focus, concentrate, look at determines my feelings. You see, Jonah, prior to this chapter 3, focused on himself instead of the deliverance of God's people. And when he focused on himself instead of the deliverance of God's people, uh, he, 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 there was no way God could use him to win this 100,000 people. But his choice to change brought about the repentance for many people. Sometimes we got to stop thinking about ourselves and think about what is God's desire, what is God's heart, and what does God want to do in this situation. Sometimes it will cost ourselves a little bit, uh, a, a little comfort, but thank God it's going to create a comfort in somebody's heart when they get born again. You see, in his presence, when the longer you remain in the presence of God, the longer you will remain tender towards God. Tenderness is the opposite of hardness. When I, when I remain in the presence of God and I routinely stay in the presence of God daily by my uh, daily uh, regimen of speaking and private prayer time, what am I doing? What are you doing? We are keeping ourselves tender before the Lord of God. His presence has that effect. But you can't go from Sunday to Sunday without prayer and, and think that we'll remain tender before the Lord. God can move right beside of us and we don't feel a thing. I'm going to deal with that. Listen, his, his presence also will keep us thirsty and hungry for more of God. Do you, it is, it's obvious. Why do people get so disenfranchised today in the modern church? It's because it's dead. Amen. It's just dead. We're not getting anything. We're just frustrated. Why are you still going? Well, we don't know what else to do. And we understand that. But when the presence of God is filling a house, there is a natural excitement and drawing towards more of God. I'm amazed at our young people in this church. I really am. Talk to them at times and so forth. And I'm amazed. Here you got teenagers. Here you got young 20-year-olds who are hungry for God. And I don't have to wave keys out here to keep them interested in coming to church. You say, what is the difference? It is the presence of God. There's a difference there. You see, he, I remember one little fellow here told his dad one night, they was going home, just a little, little guy sitting over here, and uh, he, they, they were used to a dry, dead church for years and years. And they came, and they didn't know much about what happens here. And I'll never forget it. And they told me later, said, that little fellow on the way home was quiet in the car. And the little fellow finally spoke up. He said, Dad... I forget how he actually verbatim how he said this. He said, I'll tell you one thing. He said, uh, he said we better never ever leave that church if we do. Uh, he threatened his father. I forget how, what he said. He actually threatened his dad. Uh, he said, you better never ever leave this church. And the reason why is he felt life in this house that as a young boy, he didn't feel anywhere else. What is that? That a presence of God will draw you into him. That's why we don't make excuses or think we're smarter than God when we say, Holy Spirit, you can move anytime you desire. <laughs> Whew, glory to God forevermore. You see, when a person does not pursue God and his presence, then the danger of being calloused and hard is very real. We never want to get hard. Never take his presence lightly. 
Never treat it nonchalantly or ignore or skip over uh, any inward foreign attitudes such as resentment, jealousy, and unforgiveness because in Hosea 5.15 it says, I will go, God speaking, I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face in their affliction. They will seek me early. God says, I will leave you. And when he leaves, his presence goes with him. And he leaves us estranged when he left Israel and he left. He said, I will leave <laughs> until they acknowledge their offense, their transgression, their sin. In. And he said, but when they seek my face again in their affliction, they will seek me early. He said, when they seek me, it draws me in and my presence comes into their place. Amen. We don't want God leaving here. We want him coming into here. You see, the presence of God has an effect on the ungodly. Whew, am I telling the truth? It has an effect on the ungodly. Do you know the presence of God will not always create peaches and cream reactions from the ungodly? <laughs> If I would take you to Acts chapter 7, verses 57 and 58, and, and you'll see here, here's a man of God who lived in the presence of God, who preached the word unashamedly. Uh, I mean, just in his name was Stephen. You know him well. And it says in chapter 7, verses 57 and 58, it says, then they cried out. You know the story. They're stoning Stephen. They're mad at Stephen. They're, he's preached to him. He's laid the responsibility of the crucifixion of the Messiah upon their lives. And now they're angered and they're, they're, they're mad at him. And the presence of God is there. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran upon him with one accord, and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. Now you know him later as Paul, Saul of Tarsus. Now notice here, the presence of God, if ever manifested in a more beautiful way, it's never been recorded. That when a man can literally in the face of stones being thrown and being gnashed on with their teeth and literally murderers killing him at the moment of this recording here that you just read and we read, that a man instead of wanting retaliation or vengeance or anything else literally can look at them and ask God not to lay this to their charge but he wants them forgiven. You want to talk about the presence of God being manifested. I want to tell you how powerful it was manifested. Even though the ungodly reacted violently, and I want to tell you something, they will react violently to you when, when they don't like God nor his presence. I've said this before. The God in you, righteousness in you, is a natural irritant to the evil forces of darkness that lives in the world. You can come in contact with some people and not even say a word and they're naturally irritated. Just you standing there. I've seen it with Mona, as you have too. They're just irritated that you're just standing there. Or they catch a glimpse that you must be a Christian and it just, you don't even say a word and they snarl like an old pit boy, a pit bull that's been rabid. <laughs> I mean, they just, they just, they just can't take it when you walk in there. <laughs> you don't even have to say a word and they might even say, who do you, why do you think you're so holy and you didn't say a word? It's because holiness irritates unholiness because the unholy know they ought to live better than what they're living. <laughs> oh, glory to God. That's all right. Don't let that defeat you. Know that you're on the winning side. You see, don't cave to pressure. Stephen didn't cave to pressure. And you say, well, what happened? I want to tell you something. The presence of God has lasting effects. Even though you may not see it immediate, give it time. It has worked on that soul while it's been in his presence. How do you know? This man was known as Saul of Tarshish. And they laid the, the garments of Stephen at his feet. And you know the rest of the story. A couple years later, that man had an encounter with Jesus Christ on the way to Damascus and became the greatest preacher to the Gentile world. It all started in the presence of God one day. He went to church where Stephen was preaching. <laughs> Woo, glory to God. I'm about ready to have a Pentecostal fit. <laughs> I'm telling you, I, when you have, listen, when we, listen, we are not living this life alone. When we walk in, the entourage of God's presence goes with us. How do you know that? Because we are temples of the Holy Spirit. If he lives in me, his presence is around me. Whew. 
<laughs> oh, hallelujah. I'm not into a dead religion. I'm not serving a dead God or a graven image. I'm serving a living God. And if he's a living God, he has a presence with him. The presence of God creates a different reaction to different people. You know what some people love? It's natural. What some people love, others may hate. What excites some will infuriate others. The presence of God does not affect everyone the same. And I'm going to give you a little bit of a lesson. And, and think about this. Now, I don't advise you to do it and distract yourself, but hear this. You know this would be true. During worship on Sunday morning, some will have their hands raised and singing. Maybe eyes closed. I'm not saying one's right, one's wrong. I'm just telling you. Maybe somebody's got their hands up. They're singing with all of their heart. Others are focused on uh, just, just concentrating on what they're singing and worship to God. But while in that same presence, you will see others looking around sarcastically and are irritated in the same presence that others are focused on Christ. You're hearing what I'm saying? You see, we can either be a door or, or in other words, a person uh, who helps others to walk through to the presence of God. I, I, I like it when I see little children. They'll see mom and dad worshiping. They'll look at mom and dad. Next thing you know, they'll lift up their hands. Do you know what that parent was? They became a door for that child to access that presence. Do you know I can be a wall instead of a door? I can be a wall of cynicism and be a hindrance to others accessing the presence of God. I can stand there as a hindrance and just like this here, I'm not singing, I'm not worshiping, and others, and I'll start stifling others from doing the same. Hmm. It is possible to be in the presence of God and never change. Oh, <laughs> I didn't think I'd get many amens on that. How do you know? Does anybody know a man, not a man, but a cherub by the name of Lucifer? Lucifer was in the presence of God all the time. Do you know that he talked to God? God talked to him. He was privy to the inside information and conversations with God. He was a part of the inner circle of God at one time. He was ranked there with Gabriel, Michael, and these archangels. That is exactly what the anointed cherub, Satan, and as we know, simply meaning adversary, but one time he was Lucifer. He was the bright morning star. He was this beautiful uh, 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 creature, the most beautiful uh, ever created. Uh, but while he stayed in the presence of God, the seeds of rebellion actually grew. So a person can linger in the presence of righteousness and not change. Amen. That is possible. God's presence is there making everything available to the individual, but ultimately it is up to the individual to respond. Amen. It is amazing to me, it's not the presence of God that caused the seed of rebellion to grow in Lucifer. It was Lucifer being distracted by his own beauty, becoming self-consumed. Pride now is birthed in his heart, and that now is what continually cloudburst showers over the seeds of rebellion inside of his soul, and that's why he became contaminated. Not because of God created a flawed creature. It was because somebody, instead of God creating automated machinery and robots to serve him, we had a free will, and so did the angels. And because of this, they, he redirected his focus off of God and worship and honor. And in the presence of God, he experienced failure. Does anybody know Judas? Judas lived with Jesus for three and a half years. He ate with him, slept with him, talked with him, conversated with him, did great exploits in his name, empowered by the Holy Spirit. But later in the ministry, in the presence of Jesus, next door to God's presence himself, literally fed seeds of rebellion because he got distracted by what it meant to be rich with money and realize later it was the worst thing he ever did. We had to be careful. The word of God is the instrument of peace for the Holy Spirit to use. When you look at Psalm 119, 165, great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. Boy, if we ever get to that, we've made it to maturity. If we can live a life that nothing makes us stumble. That's what that word means. Great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. You see, folks, when we come to church, I, I'll use myself. I'm a carrier of what I have focused on for the week. You say, what do you mean by that? No, no, no. I'll say it again and I'll explain. I am a carrier of whatever I have focused on for the week. What I focused on is to determine what I'm feeling inside. 
If I continue to look at a negative situation, I've created negative feelings in me, and I'm feeling that because that's what I'm focused on. When I come into church, I will emit. Does everybody know what I mean by that? I will emit out of me what has been put in me all week. <laughs> See, if there's no word all week inside of me, then it will be the fragrance that comes out of me. The Word of God will emit a fragrance of peace and joy out of my life. When I come into church, right away as I walk in, I come through the doors already emitting this fragrance because the Word has been risen all week and His presence has surrounded my life. But if I have focused on the wrong things, then when I walk through the back doors, that is what's emitting out of me. And see, if I've been absorbed in the Word, then the fragrance of peace will envelop my being. Or, I, or if I've been focusing on the wrong things all week, then when I come into church, it doesn't matter if the preach, preacher preaches like a house on fire. It doesn't matter if the piano is, is up uh, several octaves. It doesn't matter. Uh, it doesn't matter, decibels. It doesn't matter if the, if the crowd sings like, uh, you know, some choir from New York City or, or whatever. I, I mean, it, it doesn't matter. I will not enjoy it because... It's not what I focused on all week. Are you hearing what I'm saying? What we need to do is, is make sure... Well, I pray that you enjoyed the program today entitled The Presence of God. I know the, the Lord moved in here in a great way here at the end of the service and while we was worshiping. And I pray that you felt the presence of God. I know that even though you're watching by television and through these cameras, but the Word of God will manifest His presence. And I pray that you've been touched today uh, as you was watching the program. That is always what we want, is folks to feel and sense the drawing power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, this is a little bit different, obviously. There's a little bit of time yet till the end of the program. And we're getting near the end of the year. We're only a couple of weeks away. 2013 is going to end, and 2014 is going to arrive, and before 14 arrives, I have to have a talk with you <laughs> as the viewers. It's not comfortable uh, for me. Uh, talking at this subject of finances is never easy to me. I, I don't care to talk about it very much, even though the Bible speaks of it. Jesus spoke about it quite often. Paul dealt with it. Uh, there is needs that we need to just make known. And when I make these needs known, I want, to, I want to build integrity with you. I don't want to be somebody who is just trying to fleece people, come up with all kinds of gimmicks to pull money out of people. I don't want to do that. I have no intentions of doing that. But I do feel it is right that we need to make needs known because people don't know if there's a need. They don't know. And so I want to bring this to you. Uh, to be on the television station like this, and we're on for an hour, and throughout the entire year, you're talking 52 weeks, 52 hours. It literally costs us just to be on television. It's just the cost. I'm not talking editing. I'm not talking about anything else, advertising, nothing. I'm talking about the cost to be on television, period. It costs us $23,400 per year. Yeah, I'll say that again. It's $23,400 per year. That is the cost to be on television every Sunday morning. It's not cheap. This, now this television station, I just want to make it very clear, uh, they are uh, one of the ones who just, they have dropped the price down. Uh, this, if we would pay for an NBC, ABC, CBS affiliate station, you, this price would double just like that. I know it. We checked in on it. <laughs> and so I want you to understand, this station does not gouge us at all. This is a very minimal pricing. So I'm not complaining about the price. I'm just telling you, when I tell people that, they think, what, 23400 Yeah, but if you're on an NBC affiliate station, even locally, you would be paying around 50000 a year just doing the same thing. Now, $23,400, and I want you to realize that we don't, <laughs> all right, let me take it this way. Number one, we don't have it in the treasury. Uh, number two, that is just the initial cost to be on television. Editing, there is no price for our editing, and here's why. It should be, but it's not. My wife actually does all of the producing and editing of this program of Experience Life Today. Uh, so therefore, there's no cost. 
We have friends that are on television in ministry. It costs them, I think it's $300. That is cheap, $300 to edit it alone per program. There are others that go way beyond that, depending on who you get to do it. Now, there is no salary paid at Experience Life today. I don't receive a salary. Uh, my wife does not receive a salary. No board members receive a salary. I don't receive anything from this program. Experience Life Today is, a, uh, is its own organization. Uh, by the 501c3, I can receive money, and all people who work for this ministry, sound man, television crew, everybody, can all receive it, but we don't have it to pay. <laughs> so literally, folks, this is a labor of love. We come to you each and every week doing these things and producing this, and we are not making money off of it. We do not get paid for it. It's a labor of love to bring the Word of God to you each and every Sunday morning from 9 a.m. to 10 uh, a.m. Also on radio, now this isn't radio, but we're on WJJ. We're on for 15 minutes over there. That is underwritten by an individual. So uh, that is actually paid for. But television is not paid for uh, enough. Okay, so we have some coming in. Just to give you an idea of who we are at Experience Life today, and I just wanted to give you this, and well, who are you, this and that, give you a little background. I began pastoring in 1997, been pastoring now for 16 and a half years, going on 17 years this coming March in 2014. Uh, this congregation, this church has been here at the whole time. Um, God called me into the ministry as a young man, and now it's flourishing in ministry these years later. In 2009, uh, there came an opportunity. I, we had prayed about it. I uh, didn't know how to get on television. I felt the call of God to go into television to spread the word. I'm trying to make all of this short for you. I don't want to bore you the details, but just want to give you some ideas and understanding. In 2009, uh, we had prayed about it. I just feel God's calling us to it. And I talked to an evangelist friend of mine. And I said, you know, you're on television. I don't know how to get on television. How do you do this? I'm, you know, he said to me, he said, Brother Reuben, he said, I'll tell you what. He said, there is a, tele there's a lady who owns two television stations near you, uh, about an hour and a half, two hours away from you. And he gave me her number. Long story short, I called her. He said, I think she's willing to work with any local ministries. I called her. She put me in touch with a man in South Carolina. Uh, he actually worked with the PTL club back in the years ago. I'm talking back in the 70s, late 60s, and then in the 70s, the PTL club. Most of you know what I'm talking about. He was a part of that. Uh, he came in to this two de television stations in Pennsylvania. They began to work with us and began to produce it. And then we went on air uh, for half hour programs north of here. When I say north of here, we are in south central Pennsylvania right against the Maryland-Hagerstown, Maryland border. Uh, north of here, there were seven to eight counties. We were on for a very short period of time. They worked with us and helped us, and it didn't cost us a lot to be on there. We are no longer on there, as a matter of fact. But in 2010, we explored uh, going on locally here on WJL. There was a dear lady uh, uh, in our congregation who fronted the money for the purchase of the equipment, uh, uh, cameras, lights. Uh, she, I mean, helped pay for everything, sound, equipment, you name it, mixer boards. I mean, she was just a huge blessing. She said, I I'm going to front this. I'm going to help you out. And she did. That's how we got our start into television ministry. And we began as a half hour in 2010, began as a half hour program on Thursdays on this station, 1130 to 12. And so we stayed on there for a while, shot it in the studio, not here in the sanctuary. We stayed on there. And then in 2000, end of 2012 in December, the general manager of this station, uh, Steve Ullum, uh, has become a dear friend of ours. And Jason uh, Green, who is also traffic sales manager, another has become a dear friend of ours to the ministry. And ask us, John Heggie Ministries has gone off all local television all across the United States. And ask us, would you be willing to go on Sunday mornings, prime time, 9 to 10, take a spot? Well, he was about blowed away. But what happened was, once you left the half hour, you basically doubled uh, your, your cost. And, uh, but we prayed about it. It wasn't something a knee jerk. We said, we'll get right back with you. And we prayed about it. We felt a release. And immediately, and I, I'm not kidding you when I say this, and they worked with us, uh, 
within four weeks, uh, God had given money uh, that, that really financed us for a lot of the year to get us started. And people just started coming up to us and handing checks and said, we want to be a part of this. We're at the end of this year, and so we've been on this entire year for the first year for an hour. It's been a blessing to be on this, to come to you every Sunday. We have received letters upon letters from folks just writing to us, telling us just what this ministry means to them, uh, what has happened. We pray for people. We've shared in their requests, would you pray? We have prayed for them. We don't ignore it. We pray for those people. We've gotten uh, replies back and said, thank you for praying. Something happened. Somebody was healed. Uh, somebody got touched. Whatever the case, and it's been a blessing. There are some who have sent checks in and some send monthly. And, uh, and, it, and every dime of it is a blessing to us. And every dime of it goes in the treasury to pay the bills of this ministry. And we don't spend frivolously. We, we spend it very frugal right here in the ministry to be on the air and some advertising and some updates and equipment and accessories that we need to produce this program. And that's all it ever goes to. And so, but it's not enough. And we didn't pick up enough uh, monthly supporters to continue being on the air. And so this is why I'm coming to you, and I'm just making a plea. I'm not here to beg. I'm not here to threaten. Well, look, if you don't pay it, we're going off the air. And I say, <laughs> I'm not, this is, my point is, I'm making the need known. We are at a deficit right now of where we need $23,400 to be able to sign the contract to go on throughout 2014. And we want to pay it all. When I sign the contract, it is not a monthly contract. It is a yearly contract to be on for an hour. And so we need that money to be there and to have the security of it and then go on out through that particular 2014. I'm asking you, first of all, pray about it. Would you consider this? This has been a blessing to you. Would you pray about it? Would you ask God, look, should I give to that ministry? Is, is it good ground? God will tell you. God will confirm something with your spirit. And so I, I, I just want you to pray about it. I'm asking you. I'm not going to tell you. Send us a thousand. I'm not asking you to send something you don't have. If you don't have it, you can't send it, and I don't want it here. <laughs> okay? So, I mean, we're, we're, that's not what it is. I, I got so tickled some years ago, and I mean, it was not a good tickle. I was in a camp meeting one, some, one time, and, and, and the fellow said, we're going to have a debt-canceling service, and then told people to put their offering on their credit cards, and then after that, we were going to have a debt camp. I thought this is the dumbest thing I ever heard in my life. Uh, it, folks, the Bible says, the Bible says, and I can show you it here, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, that, that God doesn't want what you don't have. He wants, to give in, wants you to give in proportion what you do have. If you have it to give, we're asking you to consider putting it into this ministry as a seed, as a blessing to help others be affected by the gospel. That's what we're asking you to do. The Bible is very clear. Now, let me make something else clear in closing here today. You say, is it right to sow seed? Well, yes, of course it is. The Bible talks it about seed. I'm going to tell you, though, and, and I don't like to hear this, when I hear those say, if you sow $1,000 into this ministry, God's going to heal your son or heal your daughter. That is not biblically accurate. It is not a, it's substantiated by any force of Scripture whatsoever. The Bible is very clear, though. It, what you sow, that is what you reap. The seed has its own ability to produce after its own kind. If you give financially, then expect to reap financially. If, if you sow something else, you expect it. If you sow corn, you expect corn. If you sow wheat, you expect wheat. The Bible says in, in, in Luke 6, 38, he said, give and it shall be given unto you. Give, give what? What is the it? It is whatever you give. Whatever you give, the it then will be grown in harvest. When you sow bountifully, if you sow generously, God will reward generously. If I sow, uh, you know, sparingly, then that's what I do. I determine that. And so I want you to understand when we sow, and I have it turned here in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, in the sowing sparingly, sowing bountifully, God will reward that kind of giving into the gospel. I also want you to understand when you're sowing, we call it sowing 
Because when you give into the kingdom and you sow into the kingdom, you're going to see it again. It's just like a farmer. He sows the seed. He doesn't see it. Now it's in the ground. But he will see it again in the form of harvest. You don't sow into the kingdom and lose it. Giving to God is not losing it. Giving to God is actually gaining. Just like that seed. I sow that little seed in the ground, but I gain quite a bit of corn out of it. Okay? And, and so it, it's pretty much self-explanatory. So I will tell you, if you sow into this ministry, yes, God's going to reward you. But I will tell you something else in closing. I don't, let us not give just to get financial windfall. Let's give with a right heart. Let's give because, Lord, first of all, I love you. Second of all, Lord, my reward is this. My reward would be in the satisfaction in knowing that souls are going to be saved as a result of my helping this ministry. There is the right purpose of heart. Not because, well, I'll tell you what I'm going to give to get. Oh, I'll give. But Lord, you better, if I'm sowing $100, boy, you better give me $1,000 or I'm going to be right upset. That's the wrong motive. How about this? Freely as I've received, let me freely give. Lord, I want to give you whatever it is. I don't care if it's $5. Lord, I, I give you $5. I want to sow into that ministry $5. Lord, and the reason why I'm giving it to, I love you and I love your work. And I believe souls are being saved. I believe people are being edified. I believe backsliders are being pricked in heart and being drawn back to Calvary as a result. And I just want to be a part of that. I want to sow into that ministry. And the greatest reward that I can reap is this, Lord is that you would give me the satisfaction that I have been a part of winning a lost soul, one who was headed directly to hell. Someday I'll have an, uh, uh, actually get to meet that individual. They went to heaven as a result of me being a part of it. When you sow into this ministry, you, and you right away attach yourself to this ministry. You are now, will reap, Jesus said it, you will reap the rewards of that individual and that ministry. You will reap the rewards with them. I'm just a spokesman, but somebody else like this has to edit the program. There has to be somebody run the camera. There has to be somebody do the sound. There has to be somebody who's sowing money into it. All of us, I'm not just going to get rewarded. All of us is going to get rewarded as a result of it. It's going to be a blessing. And you know what the greatest reward is? And others being affected, somebody who was or would have been in hell will now be in heaven as a result. You can't get a better reward than that. Amen. <laughs> well, praise God. I, I hope this was painless, but I want you to think about it. Please uh, pray. Please seek the Lord about it. Uh, again, this is not a threat, nothing like that. We're just asking you. We owe $23,400. We're coming to you as the viewer and asking you, would you consider helping us stay on the air 2014? Would you consider being a monthly partner? You can go online, explife.org. You can do it through there. Uh, to go right to the donate page and all of it taken care of right there. Or you can send it to P.O. Box 216, Greencastle, PA 17225. You can go right on there, send a check right through there. You become a monthly partner. You'll be entitled to our newsletter. We'll stay in contact with you and we will not bug you for anything else. I promise you. God bless you. I hope you experience life today.